And very good evening to you. I'm Lisa Broom with the CBC Evening News. In our top story tonight, hundreds of Barbadians living in government housing units are being empowered by moving from tenants to homeowners. This from Minister of Finance Chris Sinclair during debate on a resolution to approve land at Deacons for housing development. He says government is fulfilling a promise made to residents who qualify under the 20-year transfer program. At Deacons Farm of the 320 units, 251 fall under the program. That is something to be celebrated. As is the others in Haysville, 300, 238 of 323 who will be receiving their papers hopefully in the course of the next weeks. So as is in Silver Hill, we're 141 out of 240. And you know the rest of them who may not be receiving theirs now are still eligible once they reach the 20 year threshold to get theirs too. Because the policy goes on and goes on and goes on. Mr. Sinclair suggests there has been an intergenerational shift with respect to housing. This, he says, is placing more pressure on the state to provide housing solutions. And he says government has responded through its Helping Every Last Pro Person assistance program. The finance minister adds times have changed and the mandate of the National Housing Corporation has to be revisited. An organization that was created in the 1950s cannot in this day and age, in 2018, be expected to realistically execute that mandate in this current environment. Because times have changed, demands have changed, people's tastes have become more sophisticated. <laughs> and that is why Minister Kelman, oh, sorry, the Honourable Member for St. Lucie, Right on, remember for St. Lucie, the Minister of Housing and Lands has been engaging his people in having that conversation. If the Barbados Labour Party was in power, Barbadians who paid a deposit and still have not received the deeds for their housing units would be refunded. So says opposition MP Santia Bradshaw. She was leading off the opposition's response to the resolution. We understand that if 10 years have passed and this administration has not recognized that there are persons who have been disadvantaged under this particular program, then it means that the Barbados Labour Party yet again will acknowledge it and will make the necessary arrangements to ensure that those persons are not further disadvantaged. Because at the end of the day, the National Housing Corporation is bankrupt. There is no money. But at the end of the day, a Barbados Labour Party administration understands that there are people who would have put their money forward in good faith. Ms. Bradshaw also questioned the timing of the resolution. It is almost like a stuck record hearing these, the members on the other side say that these title deeds are coming. We on this side have even said to you, if it is that the National Housing Corporation needs more resources to be able to do its job in the legal department, we can agree to enable those persons to have the resources. But what we must never do is continue to make our people feel as though it is all about promises by politicians. But the, the, the things that matter to them never become a reality. It is simply not good enough, Mr. Speaker. Our people deserve better. In response, Christchurch West Central MP Stephen Lashley denied suggestions that government was only now pushing through the resolution in light of the upcoming general election. Mr. Lashley says there has been a significant amount of work ongoing in his constituency and others, including extensive surveying work on the housing units. In my constituency in Silver Hill, there are about 240 units, and the progress on that is that the surveying has been completed for all 240 units. All 240 units. 151 of those units are under the transfer, the 20 year transfer program. And 23 terrorist units have already been sold. Well, that tells me that there's progress. I, I can report to my constituents that there's progress. 
A former housing minister says the National Housing Corporation is in a perilous state. Opposition MP for St. George South, Glenn Clark, says it is no longer serving the purpose it was set up to and it needs to be revisited. Because people go to work and natural housing is big and they do nothing. There are many persons who go to work from day to day without anything to do. And the minister must come in here and say to the people of Barbados that you have a corporation who is run, sometimes from the government, government has to fund the money, but the corporation is what it, is a shadow of itself, what it was. Uh, 30, 20 years ago. In other news now, the overflow of sewage appears to be back on the south coast. Late this afternoon, water was spotted bubbling from manholes in front of KFC and Tapas. Traffic slowed as motorists tried to maneuver along the wet, wet road to avoid splashing pedestrians. Today's overflow comes weeks after the Barbados Water Authority had reported limited success tackling the problem following its mitigation efforts, which resulted in no overflows and dry streets in the areas. Deteriorating conditions and a lack of funding have been hindering the progress of the island's lone school, which caters to children and adults with varying disabilities. The Challoner School in St. Thomas needs a significant sum to effect some much-needed repairs to its main building, and the parents and staff are on a mission to raise close to a million dollars to get the job done. Our Rianne Phillips tells us more. For the past two years, this main building at the Challoner School has been empty and unoccupied. That's because it's been plagued with rotten floor, siding and ceiling boards, and gaping holes. And each day remains closed, it becomes even worse. Vice President Christopher Oliver is involved in this repair effort and hopes all Barbadians will rally around to offer their support. We recognize that the average Barbadian, they $10, they $5, they $20, will go a long way in assisting us. We need to raise $250,000. And so far, we have about $28,000 that we've managed to, to, to acquire in the last two to three years. And we really need to get back into our building. Um, we have alternative accommodations, but they're cramped, and we would like to move back into the building so we can continue the program that we had here that was very successful. Earlier this month, the school hosted a charity cricket match but fell short of its goal. However, they will continue to sell products and furniture created from its adult training facility. We have the food preparation area, we have sewing and craft, we have woodwork. We also have agriculture, although it's not a running program, we do have agriculture and it um, in part supplies food prep for our juices and seasonings and um, chutneys and so on. Despite its conditions, Head Sonia Paul says the school has been seeing success with its students. While the classes are small, our students are catered to continually. The teachers make sure that while we're doing the individual education plan that they are progressing and many parents are quite happy with the progress that they are making. Some of our students were using bottles, now they're drinking from cups, they are feeding themselves. We have one student a couple of years ago who, while in a wheelchair, is now potty trained. Many parents and guardians hope the funds will be forthcoming, as the school provides an invaluable service for their children. What they do for our kids, there are hardly any other institution that will do those kind of things. Because our children suffer from intellectual disabilities, a lot of them are incontinent, um, some of them, they're, they're, they're nonverbal, um, they might suffer from special disorders that require around the clock attention. Our classrooms here, we might have six to eight students and you have a main coordinator and then you have an assistant to ensure that nothing goes wrong with our children. I am particularly, personally interested in the respite department because Darren is 15 mm -hmm. and in Borbidas, when kids get 18, there's nowhere for them to go. And parents are at a disadvantage because the parents can't work. Some of these children suffer from severe disabilities. They have to stay at home. Students are also exposed to needle craft and woodwork at the school, and it is hoped they can have employment opportunities across the island. We are making quilts for beds, and the students, they can participate in everything. They can stitch, they can base, they can sew on a sewing machine. And through repetitive um, yeah, 
working measurements they learn. And the idea is to get them independent. The school currently has 46 students and a staff of 25. Once the repairs are completed, it will be seeking to increase the role to 100. Rianne Phillips, CBC News. Thanks, Rianne. And coming up after the break, police issue a caution to the public after a recent robbery. A caution from police in the wake of a recent carjacking. Lawmen are advising motorists traveling, al traveling alone, that is, to avoid stopping in secluded areas to help anyone who may appear to be in distress. Now, reports are that Lyndon Brooks was driving his Mercedes along Morgan Lewis Road on Wednesday evening when he observed a man jogging along the same road. The man suddenly fell in the road and Brooks stopped to inquire if he was all right. It was then that a second man armed with a gun appeared. Both men subsequently robbed Brooks of his car worth $155,000, money and a cell phone. The car was later torched. Anyone who can provide information to assist with the investigation is asked to contact the nearest police station. The Barbados Astronomical Society intends to aggressively pursue astrotourism going forward. Director Ricardo Small says there are plenty of reasons to visit a destination. Among them is culture, history, attractions and food. But travelers' interests are a bit more up in the air as more people are booking trips to witness celestial events. He says the island's location is an added bonus. We believe that here in Barbados we have a uh an extremely um, advantageous position on the Earth's surface um, in that we can see all of our um, northern sky and all of the southern sky. And there is a, a, a ready um, astrotourism component to our operation, and we we intend to pursue that um, very aggressively. And also, we intend to pursue our schools program very aggressively, where we are going to be bringing schools into the observatory uh, on a on a weekly basis and um, exposing them to the various aspects of astronomy. Mr. Small also provided an update on the Harry Bailey Observatory, which sustained damage following a lightning strike last year. We have been able to, um, to import all of the necessary equipment that we've had to replace. Um, we have now um, retuned all of our equipment, the telescopes and, and the various computers and so on, and other support equipment are now functioning, um, you know, almost at optimum. So we're about 99% um, recovered right now. Um, by the end of next month, we should be almost, we should, we should be fully recovered um, from the event that took place. Okay, so um, visitors to the observatory on Friday nights and Saturday nights will be able to see um, a virtually fully functional observatory. If all goes to plan, elderly people and those displaced by natural disasters will stand a better chance of accessing emergency shelter. This from Chairman of the National Assistance Board, Senator Reverend Dr. David Durant, who was speaking during the opening ceremony of the Prouts Seniors Recreational Activities Program, and that's in St. Thomas. Well, Dr. Durant says they are actively working to acquire an acre of land from government and with it, they intend to construct a number of two-bedroom buildings where those in need can be housed. And Dr. Durant says currently Lancaster House is at full capacity. And with over 35,000 Barbadians aged over 65 and many living in dilapidated condition, additional shelter is necessary. We will be able to shift them out of there immediately, put them at the emergency village for a while, either get the house repaired or maybe get a new house for them, you know, um, whatever the need is, and then bring them back to that place. So we need that emergency shelter village, and that's what we're working towards. I asked the government for just an acre of land, and have a lot of land around. Just give us an acre, and we will get corporate Barbados to help us put those 15 to 20 two-bedroom, reasonably um, priced buildings. Dr. Durant says the board is continuing efforts to tackle financial abuse of the elderly. He says while more cases have been coming to light, he believes this is because the abuse was previously underreported. Presently we have situations where a family member or someone, a caregiver, may not report a situation of the elderly because they know if we come in and see the situation, 
we're going to change it up. We're going to take the elderly out. And that person is not reporting it because they are receiving the checks when the month comes. You see, they're receiving two checks. And they prefer to have the checks and keep the person in that dilapidated, unsanitary condition. Well, support for a recent suggestion that charities in Barbados need to be better regulated. Speaking during the first session of Parliament for the year, Commerce Minister Donville Innes called for a revision to the Charities Act. His comments have been backed by the head of one of those charities, President of the Seroptimist International of Jamestown, Sherry Niles. I agree. I mean, realistically, um, people need to know who charities are and everybody who says they're a charity is not a charity. So the best thing to do is to be registered, registered as a charity, and that is what we are, registered as a charity. And that makes it much easier going forward when you're seeking donations to do projects. Sir Optimist International is a group of career women who focus on improving the lives of women, children, and the elderly. As the association observes its 32nd chartered year, Ms. Nile says they are hoping to attract new members. Our club has more of the older members who started with the club 32 years ago. And some have passed and some are still with us. And uh, quite a few of our members are retired professional women. Um, we're, we're canvassing, so to speak, to um, bring in some new blood, younger people, because of course, for us to go on um, till the end of time, you have to have new people coming in and hopefully some younger people as, as they understand the importance of volunteering and giving back to the community. Another lucky Barbadian is walking away with some valuable prizes thanks to CVC's station 94.7. He is Trevor Allen, a loyal listener who came out on top in the Who Sung It competition. Mr. Allen is the winner of vouchers from Golden Touch the Spa, gas from Ruby Rubis Wildey, and a two-night staycation at Bougainvillea Hotel with breakfast included. He says he's looking forward to using his prizes, especially the staycation. I'm very excited about winning um, this prize. Um, it's, a, it's a welcome relief. I needed some rest and um, those two nights at Bougainvillea are going to provide me with that opportunity. Mr. Allen says the memories in the music keep him coming back to 94.7 every day. And CBC's marketing specialist Nicole Collins says there will be more coming for loyal listeners just like him. We really cherish our listeners and our, our listeners cherish us. And as Trevor said, hit the memories. The format of our station allows our, our listeners to live back and remember the days back in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. So we are playing on the memories and fond memories with the music. And of course, we encourage our listeners to continue to listen out because there will be a lot more coming from 94.7 in terms of competitions to engage listeners and give them an opportunity to win. We'll check in with our regional neighbors just after this break, so stay tuned. We begin in St. Lucia. Officials of the Bordelais Correctional Facility are describing an incident which happened this week as a standoff between inmates and officers. They say it was not a major incident and was quickly contained by corrections officers. Deputy Director Leonard Terence says inmates listed a number of grievances which they want addressed. Talk of unrest at the Borderley Correctional Facility spread quickly on Wednesday, January 31st. Reports ranged from placard toting inmates demanding shorter pre-trial detention to allegations of irate prisoners becoming violent. The Correctional Facility's Deputy Director has confirmed that there was an incident on Wednesday but says it was by no means major. Leonard Terence describes it as a standoff between inmates and officers. Usually after a break or after recreation, some inmates from time to time would refuse to go to their cells while the majority would comply. On this occasion, um, there were quite a number of inmates who refused to re-enter the uh, re -enter their cells after the recreation to allow the officers to 
do the normal road check that we have to do on a regular basis. When that was done, the officers informed senior management of the situation and senior management responded and tried to ascertain the reason as to why the um, inmates would refuse to enter the cells. The inmates have a laundry list of issues they want addressed. Terence says this includes concerns over court hearing adjournments and what they believe is unreasonable time spent on remand. They mention things like recreation time, and mention quite a number of things that they claim that they are um, not happy about and until it is addressed that they will not go to the cells. Police in the Bahamas have conducted their second operation in recent weeks, this time targeting the inner city. A gun and drugs were found as well as a number of people arrested. There will be an all-out assault on the criminal elements within our communities who continue to wreak havoc and we are doing just that. In an effort to put a dent in the criminal element, the Royal Bahamas Police and Defense Forces in a joint effort had a busy, successful day. Our first stop was in the Peach Street area, where officers responded to a call of gunshots. Assistant Commissioner of Police Clayton Fernanda was on the scene. Based on the information received, they saw the individual who was known to the police, who was armed with a handgun. They gave chase the individual around and it ended up just through the side. Uh, track roads off uh, Peach Street and he dropped his weapon but he was able to escape but before the day is out I promise you that he will uh, be in police custody this is what the Bahamian people want they want that quick response time if they call the police to say that there's a crime going on in their community they want that quick response and that's what you saw here this afternoon uh, we have already uh, reaped some good results we find a little bit of cocaine and some drugs a few persons is in custody from there another call came in about drugs and a gun discovery behind a residence on the Vaux street what was more disturbing to fernando was the proximity the contraband was found on search of the entire property uh, we were able to recover another weapon off the street and uh, some drugs as you could see uh, which include uh, cocaine and uh, marijuana. It is so sad that uh, just down the street is a school for special need kids and you have drug house set up right in that area. Isn't that sad? Dozens of police officers in Guyana are now better equipped with the knowledge to provide basic first aid to people who are injured. The training which encompassed basic first response protocol life support, CPR, and trauma were offered to the Guyana Police Forces officers in order to reduce the number of preventable deaths. In the past, police officers were usually helpless when it comes to rendering assistance at the scenes of crime and accidents. This resulted in the death of many persons and lifelong injuries sustained by law enforcers. The course's instructor, Dr. Zulfikar Box, explained that several years ago, working in the emergency room, an officer was injured during an accident. But because his colleagues were not privy to the proper stabilization techniques, he suffered major spinal injuries which made him incapable of walking. Dr. Box further noted that it is incidents like these that prompted him to team up with the police to ensure that these occurrences are reduced. With 72 completing the course, the force will now have in excess of 200 officers trained in basic emergency first response. Quite a lot of patients are brought by police members, police officers to the, to the emergency department. And most of the times the guys try and do as best as they can, but they're very ill-prepared, very ill-prepared to take care of the patients. And um, if you want to see the weak side of a police officer, you, uh, look, you, you see them when somebody's dying, when they're bringing them in. And it was my responsibility to ensure I designed a course to, to get there. So over the next few years, I worked integrally with my specializing project to ensure I develop a course that was not just noteworthy in Guyana, but would have stand up to the standards, international standards. Commissioner of Police Silal Persaud noted that the previous training provided saved the lives of two officers during operations where rank sustained gunshot injuries. He said the training of these officers is timely. 
We'll give you a peek into the world of sports after this break. But before we get to that, here's a tip from Cooperators General Insurance. This tip of the day is brought to you by Cooperators General Insurance Company Limited. Insurance the way you want it to be. Research has shown that drivers who consume cannabis within three hours of driving are more likely to cause a vehicle collision as those who are not under the influence of drugs or alcohol. This tip is brought to you in association with the National Council on Substance Abuse, promoting drug awareness.